<laughs> My name is Bob Schiffler, President of the Library uh, Board of Trustees. I'd like to welcome you to this, our second of three workshops. I see many uh, of you who were here last week at our first workshop, and thank you for coming back again this week. And for those of you that didn't make last week, uh, Michael Mackey, our speaker, is going to go through a brief, uh, very brief review of the topics that we covered then. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to make some introductions. Uh, other board members that are here, Pat Lord, Mark Adams, Paul Conorado, Helen Schmidt, and Dana Hintz, uh, Christine Lazarus, our library director, from Studio GC, Pat Callahan, and our featured speaker, Michael Mackey. At the meeting last week, we talked a lot about architecture in general and the history of library architecture. This week, we're going to start to get into a little more detail and talk about some of the site-driven considerations and some material alternatives, etc. Again, there'll be a lot of opportunity for uh, public input, and we appreciate all the input that we got last week. Michael's also going to run through, I think, a, a very quick summary of some of the things we heard last week. So with no, no further ado, I'll turn it over to Michael Mackey. Thank you. Yeah. Could I just have a show of hands of how many people who were, were not here last time? That helps. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so, uh, as Bob said, we're going to be talking about site analysis, plan relationships, and, and beginning discussion about building facade. So, the, the idea of these meetings, this set of three meetings, um, is that we would um, come to the public and try to, to determine their aspirations for the, for the library project. Also, present some background information as it has to do with a variety of things, architecture, the site, and those sorts of things. Gather input from the public, and, and, and basically everybody gets to hear what the, what the public is thinking for the project. So um, I'm a retired architect. I retired in, in November, spent about 27 years, I think I corrected the slide from last time, um, as a designer and a project manager. I did a bunch of things before I even got involved in architecture. But uh, some of the projects I've worked on are shown here. I did a number of projects up at Elgin Community College, uh, including their new academic library, and, and probably the other closest library is Wheaton uh, Public Library, Flossmoor, New Lenox, Addison, number of those. So the, one of the things I wanted to stress about last time was the idea that architecture is really situational that there are some star architects who do their thing, and no matter where that building is, it's going to look like them. That's not what most architects do. For most architects, it's very situational. It's based on site, the requirements of the site, based on the needs of the program, whatever that project is. It has to do with technology and how we build. And then the last part is the aspirations. Aspirations mainly of the client, and in this case, the, the public. And so, the, the architect really needs to stay open to all of those things so that they don't come uh, you know, immediately with an agenda for your project. They're remaining open and, and as I say here, a lot of public buildings are built without any input from the public, but this, this time people get to have some input. Where are we? As everybody knows, or I think you would know at this point, there's been a successful referendum. Now the referendum was preceded by a period of time where the library um, went through many steps, um, looking at strategic plans, figuring out that the, the current building cannot meet the, the mission of the library, um, and with will, both in terms of your, your board, your library board, and, and, and the staff, um, it was brought to referendum and a successful re referendum. So we're at a point now where some preliminary information has been gathered and, and developed by the architect, but still trying to gather public input. After this public input and some of the things that we're talking about tonight, the, the plans will eventually go to the city for approval. It can't do anything until it's approved by the city, and then eventually out for construction. It will go out for bid. Contractors will bid on it, and we'll have construction following that. So last week we talked about critical components, timelines, and library history. So to a quick synopsis, talked about the, the critical components in architecture, that architecture isn't just you know, a good looking building, it really has to have three qualities. Commodity, which means that it works internally, it functions, it comes in on budget. Firmness, which means that it's durable, 
sound in terms of the, the structure um, and, the, and the envelope of the building, and then delight. Um, so commodity firmness and delight, and that really refers to that the building is beautiful, it's good to look at, there's something, some quality of it that makes it um, nice. So we went through a whole series of uh, discussion. The main thing about this slide is to, to understand that architecture is not divorced from society or technology and culture, that it really is an integral part of those things. And the reason why you see the change in form over time is the changing technology, the changing needs of society, and um, the changing needs of the age. Um, this slide was sort of put in to talk about how things have changed in time. You know, we talk about this building as being maybe a hundred year building, you know, at the end of this century, that it will still be operating. Um, and so in night, we look back a hundred years to see what things were like then. Um, in terms of communication, transportation, society, and culture. Um, and we, we, we know that things have changed enormously. We don't know where they're going, but we know that they have changed. But in terms of library planning, it went from this focus on the collection, securing the collection, and then protecting the collection. And we we're in an age now where the people are more important in terms of the library. There is still a collection, but those things are intermingled. And so, in terms of wrapping this up, I said basically moving from single use to multifunction, as we see with the, the iPhone as opposed to the candlestick phone. Um, increased mobility and flexibility, and something we can all expect is more change. Uh, then uh, Rick McCarthy from Studio GC, who was here, showed a, a few um, contemporary libraries, talked about the aspirations for the people in those communities, and then how the architecture um, reflected those aspirations. At that point, we asked people about their aspirations for the library and the community, basically interchangeable, and we got quite a list. Uh, so, <clears throat> which is great, which is really what we were after. So I broke them up into aspirations and program related, and that has to do with how we separate, how we separate things that are really sort of more uh, uh, a space as opposed to an aspiration. But what do you, what do you see over here on, in terms of aspirations? These are all great. Welcoming, inviting, spacious, you know, a, a sense of history, complementing but not necessarily replicating, forward-looking, approachable spirit, you know, this, this place can be a hub for the community, uh, generational diversity, secure and safe. We're not done. This is a, so the second one, <laughs> Again, aspirations flexible, stimulates creativity, focus on the collective, that it should be proud building, uh, exudes culture, stimulating, and a wow factor. And these are, these are just great for us to hear as the architects. So <clears throat> as I was leaving the meeting, I was thinking about a, a, a couple of things. I was thinking probably focusing on two of the things which will directly impact the elevations. And those things were forward looking, and then looking to history. And I thought that I was, and then I knew we were going to be talking about the site. And so I don't know if anybody has read this book, Giants in the Earth by Rollbog. It's an older book, but, and I can't remember when I read it or why I read it, but it, it's come to mind three times in my life. The first was when I was moving from Philadelphia to this area um, between Christmas and New Year's driving straight into a three-day storm with all my possessions in, in, in a truck, my wife and my 18-month-old son next to me, dragging our car, and I thought about their move through uh, into North Dakota with an ox cart and a shelf, you know, I mean, rudimentary tools. <clears throat> the second time I thought about it was my son went to school at uh, St. Olaf, where it, uh, Wolvog went to school, and they have the Wolvog library there. And the third time was after the meeting we, we had on uh, last Tuesday. And the, the characters are what I call the three primary forces in the book are Per Hansa, who is the, leading the, the, the small group of Norwegian uh, settlers, his wife, Berit, 
and really the land or the environment that they are moving into. And I thought that, that their characteristics aligned with some of the things we were hearing and this um, focus on the, the land, uh, you know, how, how, how much of an impact that had on this group. So Per Hansa, you know, he is the true pioneer. He's very inventive. His energy level is incredible. He's hardworking, forward-looking, and optimistic. His wife, and this is not to stereotype male or female, is, looks back. She regrets leaving Norway. She's fearful of the future, uh, pessimistic. And I was reading something about stave churches in Norway recently, and uh, they talk about the light. These churches have no windows, as holy gloom. And I'm glad that nobody thought of that as, a, as an inspiration, or that, <laughs> but as a, uh, you know, aspiring to a holy gloom. So anyway, these things were going through my mind, and so I, I think that those are three key things that we'll want to talk about and think about as we, as, as we move forward. So, this is a quote from Stephen Hall, who's an architect who I really admire his work. Arch architecture is bound to situation. We talked about that before. That's not new. The site of a building is more than a mere ingredient of its conception. It is its physical and metaphysical foundation. Architecture does not so much intrude on a landscape as it serves to explain it. And so I think that's, those are the things that we're after. Um, we're after both a, a, a practical aspect and eventually a poetical connection to the land. So when I got to, when I got to Illinois, I was working at a firm and I sort of missed that academic environment and I figured oh, I, I, I could get involved with the school and so my first thought was to, you know, call um, and, and find out if I had, could have access to a library for, you know, architectural books and see if there was lecture series, that sort of thing. So I called the, uh, the University of Chicago. And it was very interesting because I actually spoke to a person. It must have been a long time ago, right? <laughs> and um, I, I said basically, you know, that I was interested in these things. And I heard a sort of a little chuckle, uh, or a snarky chuckle, and then she said, oh, there's nobody here that does anything as practical as architecture. <laughs> what? <laughs> so with that in mind, Pat's going to talk a little bit about the practical aspects. Of the oh, what a great segue. <laughs> Jeez, I think it's like trying to watch a paint dry. <laughs> so, what I want to do this evening is spend a little time orienting you to the site. Now, it's really not a, a stroll down the street, but an orientation in terms of what we see as architects and some of the things that we have to contend with and deal with, uh, and I want to share that with you. So this is the Alta survey uh, prior to the 6th Street demolition. Uh, serves really no purpose other than really to give us some fixed dimensions about the perimeter of the site. Uh, but for the most part, this was the information we started with, and I'll, I'll share a little more once we get it. So, from that, we, we, we use current technology. So this is actually uh, a what we call a point cloud map. So it's a digital laser map of the entire property. It's superimposed with a photo. And this is accurate to within one eighth of an inch. So what it's providing us is we're able to now see the character of the adjacent properties, uh, understanding of what the topography looks like, uh, understanding of the types of relationships that this building will have to its neighbors predominantly across the street. So now we're panning to the west now, uh, and it continues to move. So this information provides us really what I'll call data points, but also it allows us as a, as a fixed reference to go back and look at, is what we're doing accomplishing the aspirational goals we're trying to achieve, even if it's just looking at the layout of the property? Understanding where the highs and the lows are, one of the things that I think is interesting about this point cloud map that, that allowed us to perhaps dive in a little deeper when we started doing the preliminary uh, site diagramming was, where are the high and low spots, right? If we all picked a property to build our house, we picked the lowest spot in the neighborhood, right? No. Nope. <laughs> so it affords us an opportunity to say, where should the building go from a geology or a topography sense, but where should the building go in terms of site access. So there's a lot of forces at work. But this is a great tool, and we continue to use this uh, in, our, in our elevation studies as we begin to continue to kind of evaluate the building. 
then the practical flat data. And the flat data simply is we have topographic information on the property, provides us the knowledge of knowing that the high point serves as Campbell and Sixth. The low point is actually just east of the corner of Franklin and Seventh, serves to be a little bit of a, a drop right there in the middle of the property. So now we're beginning to understand the shape of the, of the environment. Jump in and out. Yes. Yeah. The other thing we like to do and, and make sure that we're, we're complementing all the hard work that Geneva has done over the years. The 2013 comp plan had a lot of community input. There was a great deal of information shared with the community, uh, several community input sessions about what it is that Geneva uh, is going to look like as it begins to develop or as it begins to change. Um, so this is just a plat map of the existing um, land use, and then the aerial photograph of the property, which is right here, and that little dot represents the parcel on the, on the existing site use map. <coughs> so then we take that and we break it down into its pieces, single family, multifamily, commercial, office, all in context with this site, recognizing that the residential uh, adjacencies to the property, which is here, uh, on the single family side is something that we have to respect. We have to understand how a, a civic building uh, kind of sits alongside residences, much like the old Sixth Street School property did. Sixth Street School did. <coughs> so I'm going to look at mixed use, open park or parks and open land, which this does serve as a component of that, and will continue to serve. So that's a very important. Found that out during uh, discussions with with uh, the community groups during the earlier meetings, industrial, religious, and then governmental. And what I think is interesting about the governmental and community facilities is that you go to the next next slide. A little clear. This is another. Actually, go back. Oh, I'm sorry. This is not the full. Um, if you look at where we sit at, at, uh, on the Sixth Street School property, we actually are part of a civic corridor along a, a Campbell. Uh, just north uh, to Fr is it Franklin or what's Cam Campbell's, on the, Campbell's on the north. Campbell's on the Campbell's north. On the north. Um, but what we are now is we're becoming a, a kind of a, a, a terminus of a very long civic corridor that runs east and west. Again, this was the introduction about the open uh, parks and open space and environmental features. Uh, just some significant areas uh, within the context of the downtown master plan. This is kind of confined to the comp plan for the downtown area. Um, and because of the park site, uh, which is needed in that neighborhood, the Sixth Street School site rises to, uh, and elevates itself to that. So, um, again, this kind of reinforces that civic corridor. So now we're a boundary or an edge to uh, the east-west civic corridor along Campbell and even a little bit north to James. So the comp plan did a, looked at pedestrian ways, it looked at uh, bike paths, it looked at uh, motor vehicle paths, but all of those influencers on this particular property. Um, one of the things you'll note here with the site is that uh, these are our priority sidewalks for pedestrian ways as part of that 2013 master plan. And as you can see, by the implementation of this property, we actually will hopefully be able to take care of what we consider to be some important pedestrian ways. Those of you who have gone to the park there realize you've got to walk kind of on the grass or on the street because there are no sidewalks that lead to that park. Now the park is going to be closer to the neighborhood, but the boundary of the, of the property will allow us to add sidewalks so that it's pedestrian friendly on all, all sides. And then bicycle mobility plan. So you can see the, uh, the secondary, uh, these, uh, these represent the secondary east-west and a primary north-south along 7. So one thing we need to consider is to make sure that we do have adequate bike parking, uh, knowing that people will be bringing uh, bikes to the, to the library and how do we accommodate that uh, important feature here in town. And then the network streets, plan network streets. So this is uh, 25, I'm sorry, 31, 25, and then 38. So these represent the intersections. So at 7th Street, which is, 
Uh, according to this study that was done in 2003, about 3,500 cars per day up and down that street as compared to 3rd Street, which is about 6,700 cars per day. Is, is the red proposed? Not proposed. This was this was all existing. This was a but Seventh Street North of State Street is in oh, red. I'm sorry. Yes, the red represents uh, proposed new right. street construction. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, the, the red does represent from the comp plan. Right. But again, I, understanding that that vehicular access to the site is important uh, because the town is much wider uh, than it used to be. And, and last, in terms of kind of research and consideration, is really the understanding of, of where the site sits with, with respect to uh, the historic district. And so we, we, we recognize we have to be, to, to be respectful. This is the, uh, the 2010 Geneva Historic Plan, and then this is the 2012 mapped uh, Register of Historic Places. Just to give you some flavor, they match, they parallel pretty well. But we have to be representative of the fact that we have a framework to work with and contextually, we have to understand our, the historic resources that are adjacent to us to be able to design the library properly. So now we're going to go down onto the site itself. So one of the first things we, we, we study is the sun. And how does the sun impact the building? Um, how many people have backyards that face east? How many have backyards that face west? Hard to sit in the summertime in the backyard yeah so those things are real right we buy a house we like the house and then you go out the backyard the first time and say yeah, I wish I had the house the other way. Uh, but we can't do that with a public building so we look at really the arrangement of the Sun during the course of the two cycles right summer and winter so in the summer we have a shorter azimuth which means we have shorter days the Sun path is shorter as it goes across the horizons and it sits at a much lower angle in the summertime, that uh, length of travel is much longer and the sun sits much higher, uh, so we get sharper angles. So what are the, some of the design requirements or considerations? Is obviously, we, we know we have a building that's about 55,000 square feet that we have to fit on the parcel. There's an aerial photograph. So this is 7th Street, uh, Campbell, or I'm sorry, uh, Franklin, Campbell, and then 6th Street. Uh, but that building size was driven off of the, the needs analysis and the building program that we were working with. Parking requirements as a function of two things. The zoning code, which gives us a prescriptive amount of parking, but also the practical aspect of parking as it relates to looking at other libraries and other experiences other communities have had, specifically the frequency uh, and trip change. Um, stormwater strategy, being respectful of the stormwater that that the site is serving to absorb for the neighborhood currently um, and being able to tackle that in a very sustainable way. We want to make sure that we not only meet the requirements of the King County Stormwater Ordinance, but how can we be more um, better stewards of that resource for uh, time to come. Amen oh, go back. Sorry. Amenities like uh, the drive up, uh, drive up book drop, uh, green space, outdoor space, parks, and obviously pedestrian and vehicular access. And one of the uh, areas we're exploring is a, a geothermal field which will allow us to do, use um, geothermal heating and cooling. So how basic, or how can the basic blocks fit on the site and which diagram really offers the most potential and why? So let me walk through these a little bit. So the su proposed site is, is on the edge of the historic district. Um, but in it, essentially, uh, it's an R3 zoning. It's a little over two acres. So now we have some data points. So we're talking about you know, uh, working with the city on a PUD, setbacks, floor to area ratio, how much building can, the, can fit on the site, site coverage, uh, parking, and other sustainable strategies with respect to stormwater and building orientation. So we took a look at a couple different concepts, looking at um, the building slightly down from the north off Campbell in a longitudinal east-west orientation between 6th and 7th. And what does that do for us? It gives us the opportunity to have a very clean book drop. However, it's a little close to the corner of Campbell and 7th for, like, uh, for our liking for traffic. It does provide a nice amount of parking on the south side. Um, but doesn't really, in my opinion, 
married to the site very well. Uh, again, we have to also consider this is the high point, here's the low point, so what are we doing with, the, where are we putting the building? Concept B um, gives us a little a, a bit of an ability to take the building and kind of turn it as, at an angle, uh, giving us the opportunity to have a pedestrian plaza off the corner of Campbell and Six, and then also have a, a, another building entry point off of um, the parking lot which serves as what we'll call separating pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Concept C orients the building in a full north-south direction and pushes the parking <coughs> far to the, to the west as it relates to 7th Street. Now as we look at these three options, um, we have nice solar orientation in A and B. We really have poor solar orientation in C and that is we get late afternoons, uh, early morning sun, so we don't get a lot of solar gain, but we get late afternoon sun, so we get a lot of solar gain on the west elevation. Uh, we want to control the sun with modern building materials, right? So we have good glazing, uh, free soleil, so we want to have sun shading. Uh, but we want to have enough uh, solar orientation to provide nice interior spaces that aren't enclosed. So we look at these three as options to discuss, um, we are, we feel pretty strongly right now that this one is, is a favorable option. That would be B. Driving through a building is not necessarily the best. Yes? Another option might be that you'd, uh, you'd have the, the, the north-south main part, but, but a, a knuckle or an elbow at 6th and Campbell going west. You didn't show that. Can you go back? The, the, the bottom one on the right? Bottom one on the right, here. T take the orange part and take it up towards the corner of Campbell and turn it a bit west so you have an L. This way? Yes, sir. So it'll be this orientation the other direction. That is correct. Having the L here and that. That would be one other option. That would be another option. Right, it, it orients more of the building facing um, the right. 6th Street side as opposed to more of the building facing the, the Campbell Street side. But this orientation gives us a little better solar orientation to the building, having the, build, the, the main part of the building facing uh, or going east-west. Um, this obviously provides consideration for parking so that it's blocked from the neighbor's view. Right, so we can let the, let the building wrap uh, the, the corner to have the majority of parking blocked from the neighbor's views. Um, provide some setbacks to, on the north side to, to have a, a scale relief in a public plaza so we can scale the building down closer to the 6th and Campbell corner. Um, it also affords us the opportunity to keep the play area closest to the, the, um, the homes. So that it's actually tight access to to the uh, to the residential area, as opposed to where it sits now, which is kind of in the lowest <coughs> in this corner on the far on the far corner of Franklin and Seventh. Is the drive through over it? The drive through has a, a would have a, a canopy. This 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 is, is an early iteration. Iteration. This is not. A, you know, this is this is probably uh, one we did. Uh, several months ago, uh, and the idea behind this was, you know, how do we deal with, in this orientation, how do we deal with um, the drive-through, knowing that driving through a building is probably not the most practical way to have a drive-through. It would be nice to cover, but. Um, so this kind of drove us to, to a, more, a more defined solution as we, as we kind of look a little further along. Have you determined is it one story or more than one story? This is actually a, a two-story building with a, I'll call it a third floor um, monitor, which means the third floor is set back from the two-story portions of the building right now, and it's a small, much smaller footprint, six, about 12 to 15 feet off of the majority, in some cases 30 feet off of the edge of the building, so the third floor is, is pulled back. Does it have a basement like this building would have? Wouldn't have a full basement, but there would be a partial basement um, underneath a portion of the building for, for future storage. So 
we talk about the, the solar studies, and um, this is actually um, taking that point cloud map we looked at and running the sun angles through the entire year using the 21st of every month at around 4 o'clock because it gives us the deepest angle. Certainly at sunset, you're going to have the longest angle. But what it tells us is that on Campbell, we want to throw shade on any of the neighbor's properties. It'll get up to about the curb line and stop, and the remainder of the property will allow us to have shadows on, 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 the, on the actual property, but not on the adjacent properties, either to the uh, east or to the west. So again, just tools we have available to us today that we can use to study these things, to share with you, that we look at a lot of things that perhaps when you approach a building that you go into or that you're familiar with, you don't even think about. Would you have the same setbacks that they have now in that neighborhood? Um, I think there's a, there is a, the, the setback along Campbell, I'm sorry, along 6th is a little tighter, but then that's the one-story portion. The other two setbacks, I believe, match the existing setbacks along Campbell and along 7th. And certainly along Franklin because we have the entire property. So <clears throat> that, that, that is some of the practical aspects of the site. But as architects, we also want some sort of a more poetic connection to the site as well. Um, and so here's a quote um, from uh, Christian Norberg Schultz, who writes in his book, Genus Loci, a place is a space which has a distinct character. Architecture means to visualize the genus loci, or the spirit of the place, and the task of the architect is to create meaningful places whereby he helps man to dwell. So how many people here are originally from Geneva and still live in Geneva? A few. How about the, from the Fox Valley area? Okay. How many people who originally from someplace else in Illinois? Vast majority. And how about people who are from outside Illinois? Okay, so good. So one of the things I think that happens is when you, um, when you grow up and live in a place, you probably have the best possibility of really understanding that place, the rhythms of that place, how, and just how things um, feel in that spirit, that, that, that understanding of the spirit. When you move into a place, you always sort of see that, that place at first. You see it in response or in, in juxtaposition to the place that you lived before. So if you move from you know, New York to California, there's a big difference. We all recognize that. We even talk about the East Coast and the West Coast. And people talk about the Midwest as a you know, mindset or, or, or a way of operating. So is anybody here familiar with Elizabeth Gilbert? She wrote a book called uh, Eat, Pray, Love wildly successful, you know, author. Um, and uh, she's got a TED Talk, and people like TED Talks, about the, this idea of genius and how it's changed from the ancient meaning um, to the spirit, to, to now. And she's a little bit fearful that she wrote this great bestseller and now she's got to do it again. And uh, she talks about the idea of the genie inhabiting her so that she can get this next book out. But the same thing is true about a place. You know, what is the, what is the genie, the genius of, of the place? I moved from um, where I went to undergraduate school in Binghamton, New York, to, to Boston. Right before I left, I saw a band, a traditional Irish band, called the Boys of the Lock. They were great. People were dancing all over the, the, the student union. It was a wild time. So I get to Boston and about Six months later, I see that they're playing in a venue in, uh, in Harvard. Hadn't been, hadn't been to this venue. Convinced a couple friends to go. They were very, very skeptical, Irish music. We had gone to see Pat Metheny, a couple of jazz groups. And I said, these guys, you'll love these guys. So we, we had a couple of pints at the Plow and Star. We went to, the, uh, went to the show, and I was all ready for a, a, a crazy night. <laughs> well, they came out, and as I started my first clap, I looked around, and everybody was silent. So they played their first tune, and then we heard sort of the golf clap. So what, what, you know, what happened? Same band, 
same kind of age group for people, but it's a different place. It's just a different spirit in that place. And so I think that that's an important thing for us to think about during, during this process. And those are the things that we talked about in terms of the, the aspirations for this project. So with that, Pat and I talked a little bit about, about the, the development of the project, and he's going he's gonna to talk now about ideas based on some of the things we heard last week and some of the things that he's done through his research and analysis. So how many people are architects in the room? <laughs> Designers? Creative folks? Okay. All right, well, that's good. That's good. So, you know, as architects, we like to have a concept. And it's not a concept we're married to, that everything has to, has to be, you know, sieved through the concept. But it's a concept to understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish, right? And so every building has a spirit, but every building has a purpose. But there are certain aspects of buildings, particularly civic buildings like this, that actually become integral to the fabric of the community. This is a rare opportunity to design a building, a civic building here in Geneva, which if you think back when the last one was, there's a little bit of history, right? So what is it that this building represents to us as the architect, but also in conversation with all the folks during the past two years we've been working on? And that is, you know, it, the, the building serves as a connector of many elements. It serves as a connector for uh, a river town, right? No matter what, in a river town, you have an east and a west side, right? So you have to bridge the east and the west side. You have to connect people. People have different viewpoints, vantage points, a future and a past, right? The old library, the new library, old Geneva, new Geneva, forward-looking, currently trying to preserve the <laughs> history that's here. Um, the site sits on the edge of downtown, right? So it serves that, that civic corridor we talked about. Um, it serves also a, as a connector between the vehicular and the pedestrian, right? When the original library was built, Right? Talking about the original library, a lot more walkers, probably a lot less automobiles. Right? Now, a lot more automobiles, a lot less walkers. So how do we, how do we make sure that, that we're responsive to those things? Generations, right? Talk a little bit about those folks in the room tonight, but certainly there are a lot of longtime Genevans that are in, in this community that want to see this building, and a lot of new people saying, you oh, know, I was just in, I just came from, you know, so-and-so elsewhere. And they had a great library. They had a great civic building. So how do we bridge those two vantage points? Neighborhoods, connecting neighborhoods. And yes and no. We recognize and respect the fact that this was a, a contentious, perhaps, referendum campaign. There were people who voted yes and people who voted no. But it's both their library. So to a large extent, for us, it's really a bridge. It's going to serve as a bridge for a lot of different components in town, a lot of different elements. So as we start looking at being able to understand how we connect the vertical to the horizontal, the site, and how we begin to link connectoids, we want to just bear this in mind that as a design concept, it's fluid, but this building serves as a bridge for us to be able to design those connections uh, for, the fu for the future. So, at this point, you've heard Pat talk a little bit about the very practical aspects of the site, a little bit about this more poetical um, uh, angle as well. Um, and we'd like to see if we can get some feedback, some initial feedback from people about you know, whether these things seem to click or seem to reinforce some of the aspirations you have or resonate with you. Yeah? Just a question, that, that getting into the, the parking issue, because the that would looks like it would take up a good deal of space. Parking has been historically one of the critical issues that people have had concerns about, and yet just to use a lot of space to park cars, number one, there's the aesthetic look at that. It's hard to make a parking lot look poetic, right. number one. Number two, if we think backwards, you know, maybe when the first library there were people were taking their horse, now it's a car, but with technology changing so rapidly, I mean, even the thought concept of, of, of people having cars that come on demand and pick you up and drop you off, you right. parking 10 years from now may be a different issue. Right, and we talked a little bit about that. Somebody brought up that exact same issue at the, at the last meeting, and we think, it's a, we think it's a good one. So, I mean, it, it's always, uh, th there are a couple of things happening. One is that, you know, there are, there are zoning 
um, laws. And uh, this project will, will go for a PUD, which is Planned Unit Development. I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with that. But basically, what it is is you say, well, we don't quite meet the zoning. You know, it's allowed, it's a, the use is allowed, but all of the finer points. And so let's talk to, to, to the city and see if the public good sort of of this building will allow us to do this project on, on, on the site. And so one of the things that is a negotiable thing is, is always parking. How, how much parking is necessary? You know, you have, you have conflicting ideas. People, if I can't park, then, then that's not enough. But then you have sustainability issues in, in terms of, well, do we want to make this completely asphalt? Do we want to make it permeable? Do we want to make it, you know, those kinds of issues as well. And so I think probably over the long run, this is going to continue to be discussed for the project. Pat, what right. do you want to? So um, land banking has historically proven to be a very valuable tool, which means we provide for the parking, we locate the parking, we have infrastructure put in for the parking, but instead of making it parking today, you can make it grass, or you can make it a green space, or you can make it a, a bioswale. Um, much of the design work that we've done thus far in laying out the site plan, we've really tried very hard to, to do just the opposite of what you initially described, and that is, you know, this kind of sea of square box of asphalt trying to create, can you go back to actually the, just, yeah, perfect, right there. So this is the, the kind of the current layout of the parking. And so, you know, you might say, well, that seems kind of crazy. What are all these goofy, you know, all these, it looks like a subdivision like. It's got all these curves in it. Well, think about this in context of, of being not only a driver, right? But also think about it in the context of being a walker, right? Because if you drive along Franklin, and we know that this elevation of the building, which is the south elevation of the building, will be the tallest the building will be because you're far enough away from it to see all three floors, right? And if this was a traditional parking lot, you'd have this kind of square, very hedgerow view of the building, and you'd get about every 20 feet or so, you'd get this vista of this tall building. Well, this kind of serpentine um, uh, view, or the serpentine layout, really doesn't provide you that frame view of the building. So it's always looked at in context of the landscaping that's in front of it. So the building becomes layered behind the landscaping. So from a pedestrian standpoint, again, we're going to talk a little bit in a little while about scale, but from a pedestrian standpoint, this actually begins to break the building down so that from the street view, um, it's viewed a little more, a, a little more scalable. From a, from a car or a vehicular standpoint, we actually are able to satisfy parking requirements, even with this kind of, what looks to be kind of a crazy uh, layout. What does this also do? Slows traffic. Slows traffic, gives us gr closest access to the building for those folks that need close access to the building, the elderly and the handicapped. So the parking can actually get closer to the building. So there's a little bit of genius in this when you, when you really drill into it. Um, but I appreciate your thought, and I, I wrote it down because I think it's one that warrants discussion with, with the city. Michael, I'll let you. How much, uh, how much consideration is there of, of, of street parking? Um, as of right now, the discussion has been to leave the, the diagonal parking on Franklin as it is. And yeah. no, I was just wondering if, if that part of availability is, take, is being taken into consideration. So since we're doing a, a, a PUD, we have the ability to have that conversation. But historically, zoning codes have required us to determine the parking based on the on-site parking, mm -hmm. not taking into consideration off-site parking. Um, that isn't to say that they're going to you know, make Campbell or Six no parking, per se. But that parking is still available because street parking is permitted. But it's not generally taken into account. However. Trish, you bring up a very good point. As a practical matter, when you're forward thinking and looking, saying, well, wait a minute, you're making me put all these parking spaces on the property, but people are going to park on the street. So if people park on the street, now I have more parking than I need. So how can we kind of bridge these two pieces and try to make this building and this site very sustainable, not only for Mother Nature and what we're trying to do with the with our resources, but also for the foreseeable future to understand that times are changing. So 
So, good point. Uh, so, going further with the uh, parking, I'm concerned about 7th Street, because that street is already it's too wide for the speed limit that they want there. And we're talking about up and all those traffic counts. And so I think it's going to become a, a inhospitable for pedestrians. If you put on-street parking on 7th, if you put diagonal parking, that would, A, free up more parking spots so that the on-site lot wouldn't have to be as big, mm -hmm. and B, it would uh, slow down the traffic yeah. on 7th. Mm -hmm. And C, it, it provides sort of a buffer between the pedestrians and that 7th Street traffic, which makes for a more comfortable yeah. walking experience. So I think, you, I think you could probably get 20, 15 or 20 spots on 7th Street, yeah. which then reduces a lot of the need. So, so, so you're, are you talking about pedestrian or, or traffic calming or both? Well, calming, tra calming traffic is right. making it more pedestrian. Okay. Right. So I Except think wouldn't it be harder to get out of the parking? If you have diagonal parking, you can't get out of the parking lot onto 7th Street. It's very hard to look beyond diagonal parking. Yeah. No. Well, the, it, but the, you would just creep out further, right? You would have a, a, a curb, a deeper curb cut on to seven. Is there a way to the entrance to the parking lot? To the parking lot. So, yeah, there's a the parking there's actually there's an entry here for book drop-off. So this is a book drop-off lane. There's an entry here into the parking lot and an exit here out of the parking lot. So we have two, one off of Franklin and one off of the edge of seven. But you know, I, I mean, honestly, I think it's a great, it's consideration, right? We're trying to, trying to find and define the problem that we need to solve. And certainly pedestrian friendly along 7th and having some ability to, to consider the potential for traffic calling is a good one. Is there any logic to my thinking that because you have traffic going in and out of the library that it'll slow down 7th Street because people will be going slower to go into the library and cars will be coming out, so it will make it, you know, they'll be coming out slower, so maybe it'll help stop that freeway. There's a stop sign on Campbell coming west. Right. Yeah. But not on seventh. Right. But if if this were if off of seventh were entry only and exit only on Franklin, you would not run into that problem. Right. 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 And I think in, in some early discussion with the, with the city, this is a different plan. But I, I remember talking to them. They talked about right in and right out from seventh, so you didn't have people trying to cut into the library from the middle of the block. Just consideration. Uh, parking maybe underneath the building. Uh, and also, what about some covered parking lots? And and uh, on top of that, put the photo case. Photo case. It's expensive. But it's, no, it pays for itself. It, it's the green is a time to put something in there. Right. 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 I guess. Destroy got the consideration. How many have been to the Cook County Courthouse at 103rd and Harlem? What was the question? How many have been to the Cook County Courthouse at 103rd at 103rd Street recently? It was more recently. Uh, actually, I'm not suggesting we're going to do this, but I, I think it's a very it was a very interesting way to solve a problem. So they have square panels that are about uh, 35 feet by 35 feet on on probably. Uh, 18 inch diameter pole and they sit in the area between the head ends of the cars and they're solar panels it's just a solar panel array and they have a series of them, but they have a series of them and they're oriented obviously all south but they sit in a line so they actually provide shade for that parking width for the entire length of the, of the parking I just thought that was a very creative <coughs> way to use photo the path but they, so I think it's worth I think it's worth exploring thank you Yes. Um, well, I apologize if this was uh, talked about last time. I wasn't here, but I'm very concerned about the surface of the parking lot. I, w I would be very much against it all being asphalt. <coughs> and I think it would be wonderful if it if it could be some sort of surface that would absorb rainwater. 
uh, somewhat like the parking lot at the uh, Morton Arboretum. Yeah. Actually, we've talked about um, heavy bioswaling, so we can get rainwater off. We talked about um, uh, permeable pavers. We talked about permeable concrete. So there's two. They actually have permeable concrete. It's actually a very good product. Uh, they actually have permeable asphalt. They have permeable just about everything these days. But so those are the three three things we've been discussing. So as we agree that asphalt and the sea of it is just probably not the most appropriate for this structure. Sorry. I just want to go back to the entrance and the exit. Is the exit going to be by where that park is going to be? As of right now, again, this was a very early sketch. This has not been flushed out by the city. Uh, we have a little more work to do on this in terms of the, the work with the civil engineers. This is where we showed it, but th the beauty of this look, this is that it can slide really anywhere along Franklin. Um, we just, we're trying to minimize or eliminate people having to back out of a spot to turn around and go back in a different direction. But, but as of right now, it would be here, but it's a, it would be a very hard right turn, so it would be a very, Kind of a slow turn out on Franklin, but that's a very important point. And there would be some kind of fencing around the park. Yes, the park would be the park. The parking would be, there would be a barrier between the parking lot and, and the playground. Yes. And one of the things I see with this parking lot is that you may have difficulties getting fire trucks in there with the, with the narrow the, the narrow the, the radius of the, the turns the and that sort of thing. So yeah, and that would all have to be done before any kind of. What's the maximum number of parking places you're actually trying to get in to the I mean, Or the minimum, maybe, I should say. 84. Mm -hmm. And, and <clears throat> typically that would fluctuate to the square footage of the building. And, and as, a, as sort of alluded to earlier, that in, in a PUD um, application, that's really sort of in discussion with, with the city and what they feel is appropriate. Um, you know, a lot of times in downtown areas, um, they, they don't force you to do all of the parking because they know that parking is shared, park, people are going to park on the street, um, and at, at other times in different locations, people will park in different places and walk to the library, you know, and we all know what it's like during Swedish days and festivals in terms of parking. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Um, I have a question um, from a pedestrian viewpoint. If I was walking from the east to the library, let's say at the corner of 6th and Campbell, will there be an entrance from that plaza into the building, or will you have to walk around to the front? Yeah, yeah. there? Yes, yes. There, okay. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, I think, was one of the key points. I know Pat talked about strengthening that corridor, but that would be a higher, slightly <coughs> higher entry at that point, and then a low, you know, slightly lower entry on the other side of the building. But that, which is nice because it, it gives a, a pedestrian entry and it also sort of that when you pull up in your car you, you enter. So I mean, that's kind of where I came up with the, the idea that the building is serving as this bridge between the vehicles and the pedestrians trying to allow some separation. But it, uh, this is a good po time to, to point out though that when we look at the building as it sits on the site, um, this south elevation would be the tallest elevation because you'd be coming in at the, at the main level, right? So you get the full height of the building. Um, this corner is actually, the first floor will be into the earth <coughs> below that intersection of the sidewalk at Campbell and Six, about seven and a half feet. So that transition as you come in as a pedestrian way, you'll be, you'll be challenged with a direction going upstairs or downstairs, but there'll be an elevator and it'll be fully accessible. A nice open uh, lobby feel is what we're, what we're thinking about. So that that actually has a different feel <coughs> as it faces the residences. It also addresses the scale of the pedestrian as opposed to the scale of the, the parking in terms of height. I have a concern about this whole work drop thing. One of the things that uh, parents of young children, first thing that I notice is that you have in the far two lot areas, you have a place where kids could stand while they're getting out of cars, and in the third one, and the closer ones to the seventh, you do not. But I don't care much about book drops being from my car, and I would have, I really don't like the idea of a car being able to drive all the way through against the building like that, because if you've got a small child, 
it would be more safe, shall we say, if those sidewalks went all the way to the building at some level, at least in one or two places, and have those cars turned great, out yeah, in the bookshop. Good consideration, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and, and book drops are always very difficult because you're approaching from the driver's side. Yeah, right. You're, you're create, you have to create an, so an enormous amount of property that, way, that you have to take up in order to <coughs> just take off. If you just take off one area for you know, the book drop instead of having that driveway extend all the way to the front. Did you eliminate the possibility of it just being on that on, on the, the north side? Um, I mean the, the west side of the building. Uh, yeah. Yes, because that could be a quick that could be a a, a, a quick um, loop. Mm -hmm. so, is the book drop really high on people's priority list? I huge. don't have any sense of that. Yeah. And, huge. And huge. and you could if it if it's separate, it could be like a bank island so that it were accessible yeah, for no, the I, driver. I think both of those are good suggestions and I think we need to evaluate yeah. that. On the on site traffic flow is important. I agree. Where's the book drop? I guess I'm not sure where you're talking about. Okay. Yes, sir. Traffic count. <clears throat> the library is closed during uh, morning rush hour, but it's open during the evening rush hour. We live at 5th and Franklin. Okay. Any traffic count should be done, particularly in the e from 4.30 to 6.30 or 7 o'clock, to see the, the, the volume of traffic that comes racing, car traffic, comes I'm racing I'm away. Traffic, right? mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, what time? Just so I make sure. Um, 4 30 to 7 o'clock. Hours at the library is open. <coughs> it's a madhouse. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I think I mentioned earlier on, you know, in terms of uh, the, the project, what happens is that, that typically the uh, elevations will be developed, the site plan will be developed. And, you know, and in conjunction, maybe some meetings with, with the staff at, at, at the city. But eventually it, go, it, it, it will go to the city. And they have all of their specialists within, within the city look at the, at the plan. So you talk about the fire department access, the fire department will look at it, police department will look at it. You'll have people, you know, concerned about traffic, looking at that, what it means as an impact on the neighborhood. So. You know, the, 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 that's not to say that the architect doesn't need to do that, but those things are also part of the review process. Uh, I had a similar question to the one about the pedestrian entrance. And, uh, not that it really matters, but is there a front and a back? Or it looks like you could have two fronts. Well, I've always said that every building has a hind end. <laughs> but we like this one to have fronts. I know. And, and, and I agree with you. So, but, so look at this, look at it this way. If you're a pedestrian walking, your eye level, I don't care if you're six foot four, you know, maybe a flux, is about five foot, right? So you, you view things from that level. If you're a child, you just get on your knees and look up. That's how they view things. So we want to have the pedestrian side of the building, and, and that is which faces east and faces the house to have that scale pedestrian feel to it so it doesn't feel like you're walking up to the Kane County Courthouse because that has such a strong vertical Well, it feel. fits with the feel of the corridor being in the city. You know, uh, right. But the other side, which is the side that faces the parking lot, um, will have a little bit different feel because, again, that's the side we can't you know, squeeze. We can <coughs> use some architectural techniques to drop the perceived elevation of the, of the building using landscaping and using other types of you know banding whether it's canopies or other types of architectural tricks if you will to be able to integrate those materials to give you that lower looking scale but our hope is to have really two yeah. very welcoming fronts because that was one of the aspects we wanted I like to that what's the last entry she's going to keep open tonight so the last entrance that will be open at night. If, if I could ask you to hold that until we get into the diagramming, perhaps you'll understand how we're going to achieve give, having access both at all the time by both pedestrians and, and uh, automobile traffic. Okay. Austin Chances of Campbell and Franklin be uh, one-way streets. Would that make it safer? 
terms of the, the traffic pattern, mm -hmm. that that might be something to be discussed. I'm sorry, which what street? Campbell and Campbell and Franklin as one way. Campbell and Franklin. You know that. Yeah. Right, and, but yeah. Um, Always that you have to keep looking at the impact that that has and uh, the, the, the way that these streets are identified in terms of connectors or, or you know, more main streets, traffic flows, uh, uh, you know, that would be a city discussion. Mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, just one other thing for consideration. Uh, when the 6th Street School Building was there, the west side of 6th Street allowed parking, parallel parking. Oh. Okay. Just, you know, and so on. Yeah. There is precedent for that. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. West side of Sixth Street. So as you as you can hear, there's still a lot of development to be done on the site, and I think that these are all good comments again in terms of aspirations for the site. And so we'll, these will be taken into consideration. But I wonder if we could move on to the next segment of the, uh, of the presentation and talk a little bit about plan relationships. Okay, so in, in association with some of the diagramming for the site, uh, obviously you need something to put on the site and how that's going to function and operate on the site. So for many, many years, the, um, there's, a, there's a book put out by the uh, Illinois uh, State Library um, called Standards for Illinois Public Libraries. And what this, what this book did was basically list, it was a list of uh, library sizes or pop based on population, their, their sort of status as a growing library, as an established library. Um, and then it would just have a table for how many books you should have in, in the order of the, the books that they should be, how much technology, um, and, and that's sort of staplers. So, right. <laughs> they, it, there are programs that wish that that would have been included. But so what happened is we found that the, the standards could really not keep up with what was going on in the industry. So we were finding programs written for libraries where they where they were you know slowly reducing their um, or digitizing or putting their their um, reference collections. Uh, as databases on the computer, um, but the program is we're still programming. Wait, we got to have all of this reference area in the library. Um, something else you also noticed that, that they just were not keeping up with the technology, both in terms of the square footage for the technology. Some things were getting smaller, other things were getting getting bigger, um, and so it, it became really um, I, w I wouldn't say useless, but it became of much less use as you were starting to look at programming the library. Um, library programmers also, it seemed like the libraries were just getting huge. They, the, the numbers of meeting rooms, the number of spaces that they, they were requiring in their projects. These are people, not architects, but just programmers. Um, and we found that because they didn't look at anything like synergies that might happen between different parts of the library, that everything, the square footage was just getting crazy. Just ever growing. So, <clears throat> I think we started to examine whether you know, it was valid. Um, at the same time, you had lots of librarians um, in, in their taking statistics in their own library, understanding how their library works, and being, being further divorced from, from this standard. Um, we also found the rise of what I would call the focus on the local. We, we, I was reading articles about um, places in, in Colorado where they were, you know, doing cooking in, in you know, major cooking stuff in, in the library. They were having gardens um, because of that was the focus of the community. So this idea of local really did not fit in with the standards. Again, another piece that was not working. And so it, the other part was that the architect would typically inherit the program from, from a programmer. Uh, based on these standards, and inevitably, um, the first meeting you would sit down with the, the client, the, the director, and you'd say, okay, you know, X space, you know, um, I see it so many square feet, how do you want this to work? And they'd say, I'm not even sure why that's in there. So th they were carrying over these things that didn't even apply to the library that you were working in. And so 
what began to happen was really a sort of um, a more integrated approach between the architect and the library in terms of developing a program for the library. And so Christine, I know, has been meeting with members of Studio GC for months and months, years, <laughs> a long time, and her staff in terms of trying to develop the library. So it really has that hands-on approach to what is going to be in the library. So Studio GC, after getting that information from and developing that information with the, with, with the library, has produced a couple of diagrams, just very loose diagrams, and Pat's going to talk about how those, uh, how those work. So while I'm not going to get into all the details, I want to just talk about the general shape that we, you kind of saw on the, on, the, on, the, on the site diagram. And this is you know, roughly about 55,000 square feet, three floors. Uh, being the lower level or the main level, so if this was the parking lot we discussed earlier, having a main entry off of the parking lot and then having another entry, the more pedestrian entry off of the corner of 6th and Campbell, that might have galleries. How we're providing for which, which um, door remains open is our objective is to have them both open. So in library planning, uh, in more traditional libraries you go into, you have to go through one door, you got to pass by the circulation desk, and then you're allowed to get in the rest of the library. But we said, well, you know, why do we have to be so rigid on how people enter and, use, enter and use the library? So why can't we have a social gathering space? Why can't we have the community space have two doors and have the access to the library uh, and, and the materials be uh, adjacent to that so that that library lobby could be open all day long, regardless of whether you're taking a car, a bike, or, or, or whether you're walking. So the idea here is to have the lobby space, the public area, have two flanked entry points without compromising security and have that be open uh, during the course of the day. And then have the meeting spaces and what we're calling cafe-like, and that's not necessarily mean serving food, but an area where it's food friendly, where people can come and gather and sit and talk and chat uh, that aren't necessarily going to be reading a book, but nonetheless you could. Uh, in this in this kind of public zone uh, of the library and then have the first floor uh, somewhat dedicated to youth exploration youth programming and then where you saw that book drop off having uh, the sorter and uh, the uh, staff services there to be able to receive those books and and uh, redistribute them along with some some facilities support facilities for the building is the general footprint or layout of the of the large volume spaces for the first level. So then stacked directly above that would be uh, adult collection taking up the majority of the of the second floor. There would be a, a kind of a second floor lobby at the far end or access uh, from the two entries below. Um, some support spaces for small group and conference, technology, business center, digital labs, etc. Uh, quiet reading area, we know that's important, we've heard that over and over and over again, that while this is a modern library, you want to have a place that I can sit and read a book and have it be, you know, not as lively as perhaps other areas. So the idea being that the further we move away from the public zone, which would be the more active zone on the east, the library would get a little quieter. And then again, the prime real estate is the public space. Historically, um, library services and librarians have been relegated to whatever small corner of the library they could find. And you know, when their space is inefficient, they can't provide the level of service that I think this community demands, uh, most communities demand. So the objective here is to take those staff spaces and put them on that third floor. And that third floor then can have a smaller footprint and shrink again. If you, have a, if you see a building that has a penthouse that sits off the, the edge of the building, that penthouse is scaled down simply by virtue of its setback. It's just the, the angle it, it sits with respect to your eyes. So the idea is to take that staff space and not only shrink it from the way it looks from the exterior of the building, but shrink the footprint to make this much more efficient for staff to be together. Uh, they can have access to all the services without having <coughs> extra copiers and all those things all around the library that they need. Uh, and also yet still have a, a zone where the public can come 
and have a public library lobby to see the director or see a librarian. Uh, this is what we consider a little more back of the house. They would still be accessible to the public uh, at all the entry points, at all the help desks. Uh, this is really uh, a way to kind of rethink the library. Instead of having all these inefficient, small pockets of staff all over the library, pooling them together, pooling resources, making them more efficient. Anything you'd like to add on that, Christine? You said that one. Thank you. I've got a question. Uh, you mentioned it was uh, designed to be 55,000 square feet. Right. And could you just give us an idea of a perspective? What would this building be in square footage? This one's 27,000. So it'd be like twice. This. Twice. Right. When we, when we did the initial program, as Michael mentioned, we were looking at standards for square footage of various areas, collection size. Um, one of the things I think was very important to the, to the library board and the staff was not to reduce the collection size. Accommodate what we have. Make it more efficient. Um, but still provide the public support spaces around that to make the library more, a little more dynamic and more, more user friendly, if you will, in some regards. And I think that when we started, we were about 64,000 square feet. So, our, so when we started the programming, we were at about 68,000 square feet. This is kind of pre-referendum. And then we went to the board and kind of shared with them kind of where we were at, and they said, no, it's got to be smaller. Not smaller meaning we want less. Smaller meaning rethink what you're doing to make it more efficient. So for instance, we have a space that's being used during the day by folks who don't go to school anymore, whether it's business professionals or, or people who are retired. Can that space double and be used by teens in the afternoon after those folks have left the library? So how do we take space and make it dual purpose? And that's what went into squeezing the program down to 55,000 square feet um, without sacrificing any really uh, usable area. Do you design in any scalability? I know we talked about it, that's a potentially a 100-year building. Any kind of scalability for expansion or change in the future? Yes. So two things. The, the program was based on the original community input sessions we had. And as far as future thinking, the idea is that we have planned and designed a library not for the, the geographic population that ha Geneva has today, but we looked at the growth standards based on the, uh, <coughs> the projections for population growth in the, in the Fox Valley area. So we didn't design and say, well, we have 27 today, it's too small, we need a bigger library. We looked at it in context of program requirements, program needs, community desires, community input, as well as population projection growth. So yes, we did design it for a longer view. So, if, is it designed such that it would structurally support additions? <coughs> it's a two-acre site, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's a site that sits in the context of the historic preservation district. It also sits in the context of residential R3 zoning. We are doing a PUD. So there are limitations to how high we can go, how much footprint we can have. But I would tell you that, that we have taken into consideration this looking out about 40, a uh, projection model for about 40 to 50 years, um, that we don't believe you'll be needing any additions, especially as library services continue to evolve. The idea and primary objective for these floor plates is to make them as open and flexible as possible. For any of you that came to some of our early presentations when we did a diagram of this existing building, the amount of load-bearing walls that cannot be moved um, was almost 20% of this whole building footprint. That's a lot of things you can't touch. The objective here is to make it open and flexible and convertible within the existing building value. So, I want to know the questions, and I, 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 my mind even wandered around, and I'm not paying close attention. It's going to be close. On the, when, on the floor where most of the people are, one of the things that I like about this library as opposed to, say, uh, the table, just as a, for instance, is that when I walk in, there's somebody I can ask a question of right away. And in Batega, you have to walk a quarter of a mile to get to the <laughs> <laughs> so It makes no sense to me. It just could be me, but I don't think so. And, um, and, and every, every so often, there's a, there's a librarian sitting at a desk doing, she's doing work 
work. He's doing work. But if there's somebody I can query, ask, whatever, get help from. And is that, you know, I'm just looking at this and I'm like, when you talk about putting everybody upstairs, but you don't really mean putting everybody upstairs. No. What I mean by what I'll call um, kind of their office work yeah. or the things that they need to do in an office. But I will tell you this, and the staff here has been wonderful. They really have been great to work with. They, they, they are always turning the dime on us. You know, we talk about, okay, what do we need to do this? And so, well, how is that going to work with the patrons? So, and I think that's really important because service points to them are probably the most important thing on the floor plan. And so, we talk about service points. We want, we want you to have instant wayfinding. We want you to be able to walk in the library and know exactly where to go, not just by signage, but by whom you see. So, that is definitely being considered very uh, much in the forefront of how we're laying out the pieces. Yeah, so we love our librarians. Well, we don't want to. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't think the librarians are going anywhere. <laughs> Did I hear you say this was planned so that the collection size would stay the same as it is now? No. Well, we have growth included in the new furniture layouts for the current the current collection. What I said was we weren't going to reduce the collection. There are some libraries that say, you know, so we, we have not planned it for the collection size to be. Bigger. Yes, we have. We have. You have we have. But I guess where I was going with that, and I apologize if I misspoke, many libraries are looking at their collection size saying we need to shrink the collection size because we need to find space. In this case, even though we're building a new building, we said we don't want to shrink the collection size. So we want to keep what we have now and plan for growth. I in saw the, in the list library. today of top 10 libraries in the western suburbs for collection yeah. size. Geneva was in the library. How many books are there now in the library? Approximately 150,000. 150,000 to about half what Elgin is? Yeah. Elgin is a very large community and a large Yeah, and maybe, library. what, Glen Ellen has 225,000 or something? I, I don't look, look at the discard rate, too. Hmm? should look at the the discard rate, you know, the the eliminations too. Mm -hmm. I think that's well, we're well, certainly books on the shelf doesn't space. matter that much, and it, uh, you know, there's interlibrary. Oh, right. You get them from everywhere. Right. right. I mean, That's it's right. nice to have them here, but you can get them. It was long. I don't agree. It doesn't matter that they are here because there's well, books that were 40, 50 years old that are just charming and wonderful. That maybe they aren't in the library. Right. 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 And, and certainly browsability and, and collections is, is a major driver in this program and in the floor plan. Um, you know, in this building it's just not possible. So we make choices here um, that aren't always as user friendly as we'd like them to be, unfortunately. But that is why we're, yeah. we're here to pay for this. Yeah, I think the other thing about a, a library that remains flexible is that they will know about demand, and they can they can change over time. I think what happened, and I, I talked about this earlier uh, in, the, in the last presentation, in terms of the the organization of buildings as you know stack areas, and you know once you exceeded, once you got to a certain point, you, you couldn't go anywhere. You know even if people were demanding more and more, you know you were, you were calling or you were removing books and you were bringing them in. So I think that the by by keeping it you know, open, you remain flexible. To the needs of the community. So I think one more maybe. Uh, yeah, you made an analogy with this office space as, as being a penthouse, and of course the penthouse is always the most valuable real estate in the building because of the views <laughs> that, it's gener that it generates. Is there any consideration to having this as a public space? with the views that you would get from the third floor. Well, I say penthouse in terms of how you might see mechanical equipment on a roof, you know, with screen, screening, um, because of the how we're setting it back was the really, really. But we really looked at this hard and tried to figure out if staff should be distributed or staff should be centralized. And this seemed to me the most logical place to centralize staff without compromising the continuity between the first two floors for, for the patron spaces. Not, we didn't want to disconnect uh, you know, adult services from children's services and have that lobby space. So I, I still think that while this 
is prime real estate to the extent that it's the highest level. I think the the first and second floor are probably have the best views. The, yeah. The other thing is in library planning, um, it becomes really inefficient when you start separating parts of, say, the adult service program, and you, you experience some of that here, where you have part of the collection on one level, something else on another level. Not only is it is it difficult for the patron to even know where it is, but then you have to staff those areas as well. And so there was some discussion last week about the idea of a rooftop garden or a, you know access, and I, I don't know where that could be in the design, but I think you know that's, that's an idea, that's something that might be separate and not necessarily collection-based. In one of the earlier meetings before this series, uh, the design, I believe, going down to the entrances, the lobby area, had a service desk. Is that still in the plan at oh, that yeah. point, that yeah. there is somebody, a, a staff person, near the entrances? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 yeah. Okay. Just, just a highly impractical question, a question that is only deals with the, the light element of your triangle. Uh, I've heard no mention of the Shakespeare Garden. Will there be room, perhaps, on the plaza for the Nick Shakespeare Bonham Garden? Will be on the <laughs> but, <laughs> Can that be an element to welcome patrons sure. at the entrance, perhaps? Yeah. No, nice idea. Yes. Great idea. I don't think it's impractical, I think it's... But, but it's distinctive and memorable. I think it's compulsory, actually. Right, yeah. right. But it makes this library different than any other in the western suburbs or... Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to move to the next topic, and then there'll be uh, another uh, time to, to ask questions and, uh, at the very end as well. And so the last part of this, we're going to talk a little bit about facade building materials. And so <clears throat> Pat's talked about the, um, the existing site conditions. We talked a little bit in terms of those bu the bubble diagrams about the requirements and how that has to be incorporated into the, the design of the building. And I, I must say that, that this is one of the most forward-looking groups I've ever dealt with in terms of what they are thinking about um, for the design for the, for the building as, as a service model. You know, I, I mentioned before about the division of the different pieces of the library, you know, the stack area, service areas, and that sort of thing. They're really thinking about this in a new way. The, 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 the concept is, is based on three things, consumables, books um, in, in the library, connecting, so there's a social aspect of the library, and then create, and that's the, the maker spaces, the uh, content creation areas of the library. So it's a, it's, it's a bit of a new formula. So the requirements have been incorporated into some of these diagrams. So the last thing we're talking, and we've been talking about this for, for two sessions now, is the aspirations. And these are the things now that need to be made visible by the architect. We, need, we think we've said it, now how does the architect make these visible? Now I'm gonna show a slide, and if people recognize this, please don't shout out the answer, or if you do, <laughs> just, just work with me on it. So. This is, a, this is a drawing that was done probably in the, in the 40s. You know, think about the time when, um, uh, who, what's his name? The, the Lost Ark of the Covenant, and uh, he's running around uh, in the 1940s. Sorry, what? Indiana Jones, yes, he's got a whip. And, so what, what is this a drawing of? Can people say? Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> so the guy had asked not to say it. <laughs> so this this sense of scale. Now this is more like a scale drawing. You can see. Now this doesn't help usually at all until you see really what's going on. And this is from a book. If uh, some people obviously know the book, but it starts out with the narrator of the Little Prince talking about a drawing that he's made. And he shows the top drawing to a bunch of adults and they all say it's a hat. You know, it's a hat, it's a hat. And he says, they have no imagination. Don't they understand what this drawing is? And then he finally produces this second drawing and he says, you know, it's a, it's a boa constrictor swallowing an elephant. 
and you know, digesting an elephant as it, as it goes. And so um, I think that drawings are very important as we move forward in terms of making you know, what the building is about with those aspirations very clear to everybody who sees it. So typically in architecture, you know, if we went back in history, we would begin to look at how facades are constructed. And they're based on the idea of a column, a tripartite system where you have a base, a shaft, and the capital. And you can see, this is a, a building by Louis Sullivan, how the base, the shaft, and the top all respond to that column. But we're not going to talk about that because it really is, is not the point of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about aspirations and we want to talk about how materials can help with the aspirations of, of people in the community in this building. So I'd like to just talk about a couple of different ideas and then at the very end we can you know, elicit you know, people's response and ideas about, about materials. So when we talk about you know, opaque materials, solid materials, um, we talk about you know, stone, brick, and we have a couple of panel systems. But stone obviously can be um, uh, configured in many different ways. We have, you know, see on the, on the left, this shelter, very big boulders, you know, forced into a matrix of concrete in a way, and so you have this very sort of rough and, and tumble look. And then on the right-hand side, you know, this, this almost looks like a single piece of stone that has been chiseled out or, you know, the, the stratified layers as the windows come and wrap around. So the, the, that may have been the concept, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But we oftentimes see stone as this very strong, durable, permanent material. Um, and that's the connotation that it gives. And if you want that feeling in a building, that that's important, may be important to you. So it goes from very rustic to very high, highly polished. Um, and I'm sure people have seen buildings like that. Also, the color variation. We know limestone can be very white. We see uh, Casota stone, which is a very sort of creamy um, color as well. So we talk about brick. One of the things that brick is you know, used you know, all over the world and has been used for centuries and centuries, the, the, the idea of brick as a scaling element. Although nobody here is probably going to be laying brick for a project like this, you can understand that if you see a brick, that, that that fits in your hand. You have that sense of scale as you walk up to a building. It, it, it's just sort of innate sense to it. So that's a very strong material, durable, permanent. Um, it can be a scaling element like this, or it can look monolithic. I think this might be terracotta, but the idea that if you tint this mortar, the same color as the brick, which they can. All of a sudden, it takes on this very monolithic um, look and scale. Again, color, pattern, texture. Um, bricks come in all sorts of colors, from white to black. Um, patterns that can be done within the within the wall, um, and texture. They're very from very smooth to very rough as well. And so there's another system. This is a uh, phenolic panel system. I think Rick talked about one of the buildings um, last week. And people are probably familiar with chemistry um, uh, desks where the thick black um, tops, those were phenolic. That's the material. And they can basically stand up to, the reason why they use them in chemistry, they can stand up to chemicals. They're incredibly durable. Um, somewhere along the line, somebody figured out how they could put color on the outside, use this durable panel as a building material. So here you see it on the right. This is a project where it's used in very large, uh, very large pieces. And here on the left where you see uh, much smaller pieces as well. This is a project that I uh, designed in Fox Lake. And the whole idea here was the, the roughness and, uh, the, and the permanence of the stone with some of the slickness and the uh, contemporary look of the so again, these come in enormous range of colors, almost too many colors um, when you look at the, at the deck of colors. Some minor patterns as well and, and texture. So again, another uh, panelized system is a uh, metal panel. This one on the left is not great in terms of the, uh, the actual finish of the panel, but I, I did want to show this because the amount of color if that's necessary, you know, the idea of having some fun 
um, it, it, you, you have that potential with a metal panel. We also see a number of materials that imitate wood. This is not wood on the outside of the building. I, I don't know this project, but I can almost guarantee because you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to put wood on the outside of the building because of the maintenance involved. So this is some kind of a synthetic material. It may be a phenolic panel made, made to look like this, but it accomplishes something um, else. So transparency, of course, lots of people love transparency. And glass comes in all different formats and all different, you can configure it in many, many different ways from lots of mullions to almost uh, mullionless uh, glass. Um, but here you see a couple of ideas of color behind the glass. You can frame a nice little very private space. Um, you can see here where it's used as pattern to really bring that facade alive. And I'm not sure if people know the Mansueto Library down at the University of Chicago. Does anybody know this, this, this library? This is a very interesting library. The main library is here. And they had a, uh, a need to, to house their um, special collection, very, you know, sort of uh, important and, and valuable works. So this is actually an ellipse. What is a domed ellipse? I don't know. <laughs> but this is all glass, and basically the floor is just all computer stations and desks. The collection is housed underneath the library and basically accessed robotically. So you go into, you go into this library, you say, card catalog, you figure out what you want, you tell the librarian, they, they summon it, basically. This huge mechanical um, contraption robot will bring the book, comes back up to the librarian, and they hand you the book. And so the, the, the interesting thing about this is that no more Dewey Decimal System. The computer re remembers where the book is, so they don't have to be put back in the same place. So the, 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 you know, I don't know what that would do. Maybe librarians would be freaking out. <laughs> so it's a very cool project, um, and very interesting. I saw a whole uh, presentation on it. Um, unfortunately, if you go down there, they probably won't let you in um, if you don't have an ID card and that sort of thing. So if you were interested in going, you have to make some prior arrangements. So more transparency. I think that one of the things that's become apparent in a lot of libraries uh, recently is that idea of that ground floor really being able to display and show, show you what the library is all about. I grew up going to a, uh, a storefront library in New York. And unfortunately, they had the store, they had the front, and it had a little, little display there, and then they must have hung curtains up behind it, so you couldn't really see in the library. Um, but, you know, th this idea of really opening up, this is a New York uh, public library, but you can see in a, in a building like this, I mean, it's just, it's just great. You've op they've opened up the whole lower level, it's all glass, you have traffic going by, people seeing in there, that, that really great connection. And, and glass here. And this is almost a sort of inversion of what we talked about as that, that stacking, you know, the heavy base and then the lighter top. This is really the light bottom. It gets heavy, but never quite, it's never really heavy. Fins for solar control. Yeah. Is that going to keep me awake at night for that little <laughs> Well, I guess you'd have to live across that one. <laughs> And so then, then there's other materials, um, you know, the range of materials is great. This idea of, you know, uh, polycarbonate and glass, channel glass, frosted glass, where the, the image is a little bit more mysterious. You have this uh, diffuse light in the space. We've used that with uh, towel wall panels. People have probably seen that. A lot of uh, skylights are made of, of that, but also walls as well. And I'm not, I'm just showing a range of possibilities here. And so then one of the other things is we see um, openings in, in libraries um, in terms of regular patterns. Uh, and then we see we have the potential for uh, a configuration that is not so regular. And so these two projects, they're, they're completely different projects. This is a university uh, courtyard, basically. 
But I think you can see here the idea of all of these punched, regular punched openings in the wall. What's happening behind them, I guarantee you that it's not the same thing happening behind each window. But they, they do that, and then they make the, the space behind it accommodate to the, to the opening. This is a, a model of a project by uh, Stephen Hull, who I talked about before. Um, it's a, a, for a branch library in New York. You can see that he's done almost the complete opposite. We have this very simple rectangle is the library. And then he's gone in and carved out of the facade um, some interesting shapes that correspond to uh, what might be happening right behind it. So really finely tuned. To the, to the experience within the building, and you know, it becomes a sculptural object you know, on the exterior. Um, he's also shifted the building slightly off the grid. He's created a little plaza here with a bridge, that sort of thing. It's, it's in Queens, which is my, where I grew up. Material itself. So. You, you display material. And it's in, and it would be one that uh, would be very uh, good in the context of the neighborhood, which probably has more um, stucco buildings than any mm -hmm. other part of town, and that could be realized in more concrete. Level of right, right. Um, stucco on commercial buildings. Well, that's why I didn't say stucco, yeah. but the look of stucco. The look of stucco. So it's a monolithic sort of plaster look, and there have been very some some successes, but. Lots of problems with um, stucco. But for what the, I, 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 that's why I went to pour concrete. Pieces. Right, and then you have you have concrete. Yeah, and that I would I would sort of put in that idea of the you know the opaque stone. Yes, and there there are a number of uh, man-made or what we call cast materials as well. So you have cast stone, you have cast concrete. That, that last concrete. example that you showed. Look, it could be yeah, it, it could be it could be cast. He, he uses cast concrete. It could be a it could be a metal panel as well. So. Is, is that too early for asking a question? Um, you actually said something very relevant, which is about lighting. Mm -hmm. um, what happens for the people who border on the north and south sides of where there are homes? Well, the, they're right. sheltered by trees. Um, is there going to be a way so that the light isn't distributed into their homes in the evening right. and they might not want it? Sure, sure. That's an understandable prop question. And I think that the architects will be studying that. So our, our you know, we, we, when we design uh, a building, either the site lighting or the interior lighting cannot cast direct light outside the property line. So it's called light trespass. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that but that's on the oh. north, so that's less relevant. Well, well, no, so that building stuff. right now is facing, um, it's centered, facing, it's in east west. So. so, you know, this is a really interesting kind of architectural idea, and that is open and close, right? So we talk about rhythm, we talk about scale, we talk about all these things, but, but the, the notion of open and close, so when you look at that model, you know, you're judiciously placing openings so you can view what's inside or so that the inhabitants can view outside. And I think we have to be really cognizant of the fact that we actually have different neighbors on all sides of this building. And so we have to be really careful with how much open and how much close the building will have. So that's part of the next step for us is the, the, the elevation studies to start looking at not only the impact on what it looks like in terms of the context of the actual building envelope, but what does it look like in the context of its neighbors, and also what impact does it have on the context of the neighbors. So that's very, very good points, and it's certainly something that I want to write down to make sure we, we share with you our consideration for that. I, I just have two more slides, and then we can get to a question and answer period. So in terms of Geneva aspirations, some of the things we talked about last time one of the things that was mentioned was energy focus. And I thought that um, there are a couple of things possibly associated with that. Green spaces, you know, green roof, natural light, solar controls, locally sourced materials, and, and potential of non-traditional forms. 
And so Rick showed this library in Seattle the last time, and you can see that he talked about the slope of the roof and how it sort of mimicked some of the rolling hills. It was a green roof as well. Locally sourced material timbers for the for, for the uh, roof structure as well. And then we see this series of horizontal louvers that probably are doing some sun shading uh, on that face of the building. Um, we see them up here. We see that those those take on a certain form on the building in order to uh, mitigate the heat gain, uh, especially on the south side, where you want the light in, but you don't want the heat. And then this is a, a project uh, in Des Moines, the Des Moines Public Library. I don't know if anybody has been there. Uh, when it was, it's designed, basically, this is a, a copper uh, looking uh, glass. Uh, but you can see how the, the roofscape is completely, completely green. Um, the building sort of has this non-traditional form, probably in part because of the location in the in the city. But you can see it; it sort of makes make this makes this bend and allows this really nice public space here, public plaza, as well. And so, you know, I think that you, those are some of the things that are associated with a building that might have energy focus. So the last thing I did was I took a look at some of the this was another one that Rick showed uh, last week. Some of the, the aspirations. Um, these are what was told to us. Yeah, and they, these are sort of some of the ones that I, I grouped together that seemed similar. So before I get into the aspirations, I'll talk just a little bit about this architecturally. And then we'll go into the aspirations and see if some of those things are achieved in here. So what I see here basically is that the architect has made a huge frame to frame this front facade. You can see that clearly. You can also see sky through here. So they've deliberately stretched this beyond the building. So it's not, this isn't even part of the building, but that frame became very important. And so he's got this big frame that frames the building. And then he's got this smaller frame that begins to frame the pedestrian level, the smaller level. And so then he layers the building. This sticks out with this white panel. So you get that, you both, you both see the relief and you see that change in color. And then at the lower level, you see this, again, panelized sort of wood, which um, again changes the plane and also changes the color. So he's done a, a bunch of different things here compositionally and in proportion. I don't know what's going on with this library sign. It seems like it's falling over. So, but. Yeah, I man. <laughs> So how does it respond to these, these things that were Geneva aspirations? And these are the kind of questions we're, we're probably going to be asking the architects next time they, get, they, they show us uh, the drawings. So is it welcoming? Is it approachable? So I think there's a lot of things going for it. Transparency to see activity within. So we see this really large window. We can see in there. We can see the entry very clear. Very clear. There's a sign. We know what it is. But the light levels, the light levels are really nice. So people feel safe coming to this building. There's, okay? The other part is clarity of parts. As I mentioned, this frame, this other frame, you can really see what's going on there. There's no, there's no muddying of the, of, of the parts. Um, is it accessible? Well, I see, I see a curb cut here. And I can bet, because I see stairs here, that there is a ramp that comes up along the building here behind uh, this low section of the wall. User amenities. We see bike racks. We see seating out here. And I also see you know, exterior services. So people can probably come and get a book late at night, or they can return their books, you know, whatever the, you know, those services are. That's a plus. So he's got a cool palette of materials, the dark gray and the white. But then they really sort of heat it up at this point of the building here. Just feels warm, inviting, comfortable. So I would say that it feels friendly. It doesn't feel, you know, if it was all panel, it might feel a little cold. It feels very friendly. And then fun. And maybe other people don't agree, but whenever I see things like this where windows are placed, I always think to myself, there's something weird going on behind there. So that's, that's something interesting to check out. So I think he's done a bunch of things, or she, I shouldn't um, to accomplish things 
that were aspirations that everybody said here. May not be the final result that, that Studio C comes up with, but these are the kinds of ways we're going to be looking at it when they come back and talk about the building. And so then the last discussion really would be based on resource stone, we talked about panels, and so you know, are there specific materials, forms, patterns, regular, irregular, that seem to closely correspond with the stated aspirations that people have been talking about? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we spoke about last week was uh, the history of Geneva and fitting into that historic site. Uh, and of course, a good many of our early buildings were built of uh, limestone. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that time, they used it structurally. You know, you're talking about a wall sometimes 18 sure. inches thick. Uh, however, I've seen an application of it now on Campbell Street, where it's been used uh, horizontally and looks like an old building, but it's facing. It's about two inches thick, and it looks really authentic. Right. Uh, so, so it's in the 500 block Campbell Street on the south side, mm -hmm. and it really looks good. Right. So the idea would be to use stone as a, a, an example of which aspiration? Our historical connection. Historical connection. Connection to the community, but it's not honest. What's not honest about it? It's because of the facade. Well, it's it's are you going to get your show and tell over here? What? <laughs> yeah. And so, well, stones, yeah. And, and you know, one of the things about stone um, as you said, it was used structurally. And now the, the cost to use strong stone structurally like that is, is fairly heavy. And so what's happened is the stone has gotten thinner and thinner and thinner, and it is really a veneer. And so much like we talked about the panel system, it's really not that thin, but, but it, is a, it, it is really used as a, uh, as a cladding rather than as a structural. Well, that's, that's what I was saying. Exactly you could give the appearance mm -hmm. of a structural, uh, a, a structural piece to the uh, building. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I said, it's only about two inches thick. Okay. S similar to the one that you said you designed. Right. With, with, with the stone that, sure. that, that would fit into the community very much. Right. So the idea is that stone represents that, that that ideal sort of a permanence, durability, you know, the things that I had listed on there, and that you see that as a continuation of a historical precedent or a, uh, in, the, in the community. I think it's important to remember that you're in the historic district. The historic district ends at 7th Street. So the library will be in that district. Mm -hmm. And we've got a Committee called the Geneva Preservation. Right. And <clears throat> I, I know they wouldn't go for the plates, the plastic or the metal okay, plates. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, uh, right. Well, uh, well, some materials are also used as an accent material and not necessarily the full building material. So, so I mean that. But I look at it and I see 1950. Sure, okay. We want it to, to be good looking. A right. uh, hundred years from now. Of course. There's a couple of places on Roosevelt Road that used to be places. We all can kind of wait for them to tear them down. Oh, well, I don't think they're very <laughs> They were. You mean uh, on, on 88? Pardon? No, on 38. Oh, 38. I'm sorry. Yeah. I still call Roosevelt Road. <laughs> no, I was thinking of the Helmut Yan building. Oh, okay. So, so how do people think about levels of transparency? within the building. Do we, do we think that that's, that's an important thing or, you know, we have that aspiration of connection that connects you from the inside to the outside, it brings in natural light. Is that, is that something that they should pursue? Yeah, it should be both. It should have okay. seclusion and openness. Okay. I think openness should be towards the parking lot and not towards the street side. I, um, I don't know, but whatever I just said about lighting, I just think that being able to look out into the neighbors across the street's yards is going to be intrusive. 
So maybe have windows that are high up for lighting, and not necessarily down where people can look in from uh, Campbell Street, but definitely from the parking lot. I think there should be all kinds of. Right. And that can be that can, that can be worked and fine tuned, and you know if if there were even homes across the street, they would still have might have windows that looked out from the second story as well. So I mean I think I think a judicious placement of openings on that yeah. side might be very important, and sort of how that those materials how they connect and, and define we help to define that. Part. Don't you, don't you have to <coughs> okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you look at glass and windows this way uh, as well as um, allowing light in but to me it just importantly is sending a message of welcoming from the exterior that you can see what's in there it looks inviting and that's that's a component that was pretty far up on our list of right. aspirations right sure so, so, so building that opens windows Excuse me? Is it a building where you can open windows? Are most libraries probably don't open windows, do they? Um, most engineers would like you to not open windows. <laughs> 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 probably not. But, but th there is a possibility. So, that, that, you know, that's nice to have fresh air. But it, it or have a place to go get some fresh air. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> there, there are problems in terms of what yeah. that does to the system. And that's it. And also the material, depending, we discussed the materials last time, uh -huh. and humidity and so forth can be very damaging. Oh, sure. absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you talk a little about the geothermal well right. system okay. you were going to put in? Is that... I'm going to let Pat... How long do you have? <laughs> I was going to expert. add 25 words or less, considering oh. the time. <laughs> Um, so we, we are, are evaluating a vertical well system that drills a well about 400 feet in the ground, mm -hmm. several of them. Um, and what it does is it has a, a closed loop system, so we don't take any water out of the earth, we don't put anything back, it's just a, a hole to allow us to have contact time to change the temperature of the water, or rather maintain the temperature of the water to be, anyone know what the constant temperature of the earth is? About 55 degrees. So the objective is to keep and maintain that temperature. Does anybody know the discharge temperature of a chiller? About 55 degrees. So now we have Mother Earth doing a few things for us. So that is really the intent behind the geothermal system. Um, we still will meet all the ventilation requirements. You know, today in uh, ASHRAE, which is the Association or the Society of Heating and Refrigeration Engineers, uh, public buildings require more fresh air. Um, so we're bringing in more fresh air. Uh, the benefit of the geothermal system is we're able to dehumidify your round uh, without, this, without necessarily having a specialty chiller system to do it at the same time, which is a very expensive mechanical system. They call it it's a four pipe system. So you got a chiller and you got a boiler and you're doing things simultaneously. So you're taking hot water and you're making it cold, and you're taking cold water and making it hot. You try to balance temperature in there where the geothermal system does it inherently. Uh, and we really reduce energy consumption. So that's really the intent to be not only sustainable, but also to take advantage of what we have available. And people say, well, geothermal, you know, it's a new technology. Well, it's a 1970s technology. No. We've just managed now to perfect it to the point where mechanical systems are sophisticated enough now uh, that, that they can manufacture the components for geothermal to make it effective in a commercial application. We had heard that you don't actually have to drill straight down. You, if you're below a certain depth, it could be lateral as long as you have the right length of, of the system. You can do a horizontal loop system, which are shallow systems. The problem is we only have two acres to work with. So in all likelihood, we're going to have to go vertical in order to get the number of well points we need. Um, there are others that actually will drill into the aquifer, take the actual aquifer, which is 55 degree water, pump it through the building, and then push it down the other side. Those systems are now being a little less used because the EPA is looking and saying, wait a minute, you're taking something out of the earth and you're putting it right back in the aquifer, you're running through this pipe and we have no idea what's in your pipe. So leave our water alone. Mm -hmm. So whereas the closed loop system allows us to stay away from that, that issue. But you're absolutely right. I would say that the technology actually goes back further, probably to the time when people lived in caves. True. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have to put in that other system you were talking about, the heating, cooling thing, if we don't use the geothermal? No, I'm not saying that. There are other oh. systems that, that both heat and cool. But if you want the equivalency 
of having of being able to do simultaneous heating and cooling, you would need a four pipe system because traditionally in this climate you have systems that will heat and systems that will cool and what you do is you do a conversion at certain points of the year and it's always those Indian summer days or those tweener days that make it really challenging to, to make the building comfortable and so we think this is really the best of both worlds because we not only are being very sustainable but we're also being very uh, uh, efficient with the Do you have the budget things. at maintenance cost for those drilling and wells? And the, well, uh, the well fields last about 50 years. Uh, right now, um, I, I actually went to a conference about uh, at the beginning of May. Uh, some folks out in Oregon had a, a building that they were just now changing the well field, and it was installed in 1972. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Where would you be proposing to do the geothermal drillings? Below the, below the parking lot. Yeah, so we, we would be very judicious with what's, you know, again, permeable pavers, etc. Uh, have a stone base, but be very judicious on where we place those. Uh, the geothermal header pipe is typically four, about four feet below grade anyway. So there's enough bridging there to have a uh, parking lot below. How big a circumference do you need? Oh, uh, they're about eight inch diameter holes. Oh. Six to eight yeah, inches. It, it's called a well, but it's really just a, a pipe. Oh, okay. The bore. Yeah. In, in 50 years, then, what do you, you have to do? 50 years? You have to uh, make a, a repairs to the to the system, but as I said, you know. That's quite long. But any, any system you'd have to repair, you know, in shorter time frame. 30 years is typically most, most traditional mechanical systems. But as I said, this, this gentleman was talking to me about this, and he said they, they put in, it was actually a, a Composite pipe. I, I didn't even. I don't even. They don't even make it anymore. Uh, but what we put in is actually the Nicor pipe, the heavy wall PVC. PVC. Well, it's actually uh, uh, polyurethane. Polyurethane. Polypropylene. Polypropylene. Yeah, polypropylene. Thank you. Polypropylene pipe. So the, it's a thick wall pipe. Um, all heat welded. You know, anybody anybody use PVC pipe doing any little plumbing products in their house? The purple stuff. Right? And then you put the glue on, and you can never get the joint apart again. You've got to cut it open. Well, that's essentially the same, except you're we're heat welding it uh, instead, of, uh, instead of using a, an adhesive. So that's a geothermal in more than 50 words. Yeah. Now, I'm all supportive of the geothermal, also uh, planning for solar on the, on the roofs. Absolutely. And then um, just in regards to structure, I mean, uh, obviously residential area, I think making a, a large, I think the structure has to be broken up in some way. Right. So it's not like a, a one mammoth structure. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that that's part of the, the, the next study that they will be doing. We know that there is a long facade along the street. So what are the scaled elements, the, you know, major elements, minor elements? How is that facade? And, and, and Don't make it look like Myers. <laughs> how, they, no how they move in and out of the room of that facade becomes very important. Yeah. So that's all part of the study that's coming up. Yes. I was just going to suggest maybe um, looking at some of the libraries and other historic districts. I'm thinking Hinsdale, LaGrange, um, just in the not too distant area. And what did they use as far as materials to sure. incorporate the, you know, Hinsdale, I can think of, you know, they were using pillars and, you know, they have a lot of that right. in that area. And LaGrange uses more of the bricks mm -hmm. that are very common. But right. it might be a good idea to just kind of look even beyond that. They, right. You know, combine public libraries and historic districts and sure. what are those elements. I, I understand. And actually, I, I did the library. Range. I know oh, did you? Very okay. well. But the, the thing we have been trying to talk about, you know, here is is what is this community's aspiration? So, sure. you know, th that community had their aspirations for what the library should be. Um, but we really want to try and focus, and that's why I've sort of tuned this discussion uh, on materials not to you know look at a bunch of buildings and say what do you like and what do you don't like, but if you can give us that, give the architect that feedback about. You know, as I said, opaque, transparent, mysterious. How do you want the, the building to to sort of feel on the, the interior as well? You know, we, we talked a little bit about the facade. 
viewing in, viewing out, how that works. Those are the kinds of aspirations. And then they're going to come up with some ideas about materials and how those are, um, you know, distributed on the facade. You know, is it a tripartite system? Is it using monolithic materials and then a lot of transparency? That's a, so I, I would expect that they come back with a bunch of ideas. Is there any material that's produced locally that you know, would be suitable for the kind of Yeah, Pat, Pat and I were talking about this. The, the original stone on the library has been quarried out. Is that, is that correct? Right. Yeah, that, that yellow, dirt. That yellow <laughs> dirt stone is. Oh, yeah, no. Well, well you can get it. You can get it's something that's, uh, yeah. I'll say close, but not really close because it's not quite as bright um, that many people take and then they stain to get it to match. Yeah. So, locally sourced, that there are some components that are, but not many. Yes. Actually, I believe there's a quarry in Wisconsin that has a similar stone which was used at St. Mark's with their addition oh, yes. on. Right. And in which case it was a veneer stone. Yeah, right. But it's, it's close. It's close. Yeah, yeah and I, I used a, 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 a quarry in, in Wisconsin for one of the projects I worked on, and, and another one in Minnesota as well. So they, they, there are quarries. Do you remember any, anything about uh, Elon Musk's late announcement about uh, the material he's uh, proposing for a tile instead of uh, yep. PD? Uh, Solar panel tiles? Yeah. Yeah, we have. Is, we, that, is that even available? It is available on the residential scale right now. We have been kind of monitoring that because obviously, you know, photovoltaics has really made a, a big push in the past two years to become far more efficient um, and a little less obtrusive in terms of the scale of the actual panels. So we are still monitoring that piece of it. Uh, right now, he's collecting orders, but we have no confirmation as to when he plans on delivering. So uh, <laughs> if, you, if you're following that whole situation, you may be all understand exactly what I'm talking about. He's got to send spaceships to Mars. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So he's got a lot of orders, and his, his balance sheet looks good. But uh, right now, I don't know when the delivery time is. And, and I know that we did studies years ago for you know panel systems, and the 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 oh, front cost was quite high. And then the payback, by the time it paid back, you would have to replace the panels. And so there was really no, no gain, but you still had the cost. So I think that those kind of analyses will need to be done to, to make it truly uh, uh, a winning situation. Yeah. On the um, energy efficiency, are there any uh, um, financial incentives either by private companies or the government. I know we can't protect what the government's going to be doing, but is there anything you Which can tap into there? <laughs> well, right now there are incentives by the state of Illinois that have just been turned over to ComEd or Exelon for management. Um, DECO, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, as of May 31st, no longer manage the program. You are all paying th for the program. There is a user fee on both your gas and your electric bill to get uh, money in those coffers. And it's been used as an incentive for lighting conversions and, and more creative custom uh, projects. So there are some out there, and we, we will mine and find every opportunity to find additional funding uh, where it is available. Pat, just for edification, we're talking about a 55,000 square foot building. What was, what's the size of the roof that we're talking about for a 55,000 square foot building? So Roughly. the fo footprint wise, um, we're at about, 27,000 square feet. Okay. I mean, as a footprint. And again, it varies a little bit. If you. Okay. So to your point, the amount of solar panels, anything else that we would have to have, the footprint to kind of do a return on our investment right. is not, not realistic. So. Right. Because, okay. you know, with, with photovoltaic panels, there's the energy you gain by immediate usage off the panel that you can use to charge or, or supply energy to a building system and then there's the storage piece and the storage piece gets expensive because you got batteries and all kinds of other things but, but we're going to investigate it flush it out fully so we can make sure that everyone and they have net metering so yeah. the no. you can do net metering it's complicated
So other ideas on? I, I just had a question. I, I know that you know, Geneva was founded as a river town, and we're going to be a river town in 100 years. So I was just wondering if there's any, you know, is that a concept that can be, you know, thought about at least included in a design that somehow echoes our, our riverless? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> standing water. Yeah, we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I <laughs> river would bring a stream. You know, <laughs> part of the That's, that was kind of, you know, when I was coming up with this, water. the broader <laughs> concept of the bridge, I really did think about the river, because I, I really do think that that's such an integral part of of the communities up and down the Fox Valley, uh, that I think it would be, it would be, I don't want to say criminal, but certainly uh, short-sighted of us to to not consider how that has some integration, not in a literal sense, but an interpretive sense. Uh, in the life of yeah. Because a bridge is a is a very cool metaphor. You know, it really connects one. You know, if you're standing on one side of a, a river and there's no bridge, you have no real understanding of what's on the other side. You know your side. But as soon as you put the bridge across, you understand the landscape you come from, the landscape is touch, literally touching that new landscape. And here you are poised above you know, a, a body of water. So it's a really a, a very, a very cool uh, image, and I think one worth you know, investigating for. Like a water feature or something along those lines, potentially. Okay. So we will stand here and talk as much as you want to. But I really do want to thank you all. In, in, in the interest of time, it's almost nine o'clock. And no, no, I don't worry about closing. I'm happy to spend as much time as yeah, you want. Are you, are you going to talk about your uh, the problem over there? Sure. Mike, do you want to talk about the problem? Well, uh, no. For first, <laughs> first, first, I want to say that um, thanks, thank you all for because as soon as we bring people up, it's going to be chaos. But thank you all for coming and thank you for the input. This is really important part of part of the process. Um, the, the next thing is that the, the, uh, we're going to take a break from these meetings for a little while. The architects are going to be developing schemes for, for the exterior elevations based on a lot of the input that they've heard uh, over the past two weeks. And then going and talking to the, uh, to the city about some of their ideas before coming back in a, in a few weeks in July, we'll back, be back to a meeting in July, to sort of talk about the different elevations to explain them, to talk about your aspirations and how you see them in, in these designs, um, and then hopefully move forward from that in terms of a, eventually a submittal to, to the city. So we welcome you to come up here, but I just want to explain. So what we have here is just a variety of different building materials, um, you know, high efficiency glass and glazing, uh, you know, metal um, uh, framing systems for, for great glazing and curtain walls. Translucent panels, just so you understand what, what's available. This is only one piece. This is actually, I brought this, and I'm hoping I can leave it here because it weighs about 300 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, is the translucent but, panel structural, or is it? Uh, this can be structural when used in, in a roof. There's actually a, 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 an element that they add to this for the roof. So they actually put a gel inside that makes it energy efficient. Um, but just to sh the only reason I brought this is not to represent what we would propose. But just to give you a flavor for this notion of how architecture is really in large, large regard a response to what's happening in, in, let's say, the industry or the construction community. You know, this is actually a precast panel. Most people would think it's an industrial building. But it is amazing the, the technology that is now available to us uh, to be able to construct buildings out of different materials that you know probably was not readily available even five to ten years ago, at least to the degree and so the quality we see there. Well, it's it's actually brick. It's it's skinned brick. It's like a veneer, like you'd have any other. I'm not proposing it. I'm just talking. About it. <laughs> so if you want, it, you can take it home. It only weighs 300 pounds. Yeah. Um, but we also have uh, you know some of the phenolic panel panel materials just for you to look at. And again, you know, similar uh, uh, truss buff, which is phenolic panel materials that are made to look like wood and other materials. Again, notion being. Durable, we have to respect this as a public building. There are maintenance costs associated to it. The cheaper or the more economical we can build a building to reduce maintenance expenses, the, the long term exposure to the community is less. Um, stone, metal panels. So, we just wanted to give you and bring some, some materials that you know, we look to, and we're not suggesting color, scale, but like in this case, brick, you know, just the varying textures that there are available in just the brick material alone. Um, 
not just in color, but also in, in surface. And you know, we're not even showing here the polished or the, the, glazed, uh, the glazed brick. And then, you know, these are actually synthetic stone panels. Uh, we didn't bring any, any limestone, but cast stone as we call it today. So this notion of being able to quarry, you know, it is somewhat of an invitation. You know, even, even if we were able to get something that is most closely matches the original, it's not going to quite be the original. I, I might want to ask one thing. You know, we were talking about bridging and history and the notion of where we are and the river. If um, I'm thinking of you know, murals that are somehow etched into whatever the exterior of the building is showing, Potawatomi, showing, showing the river, um, not like we have the uh, over by the uh, Jewish thing where it's up. If you put on the building, but if they're, you know, you can even do it on the glass. You can, you can have. So Victoria telling a story right. of, of Geneva. Right. Telling a story with the material. And, or you could just have and water. You could just have a water. Well, it can be abstract, too. Showing right. things, you know, the Indian. This, I just think that would be really cool. And it would break up uh, really modern things. Yeah. Showing the Indian. Yeah. 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 Yeah.